Uh, my name is Lucas. I'll go into the introduction into, uh, for a bit, but this is my company, Eliatra. We are known as the Open Search Experts. We um, offer kind of first class support for Open Search, which is an enterprise level database. Um, and we also maintain the security plugin as well as doing a lot of the documentation, a lot of the work for, with Open Search as well. And I'm here today to talk to you all about uh, conversational search, which uh, has many names, but is the name that Open Search uses for its implementation of. LLMs and embedding services on documents and objects that ex exist in that database. So it's essentially linking in uh, your LLMs, your conversational chatbots, your embedding uh, models, and everything into your data that exists on OpenSearch um, and how to utilize that to get the most out of your data when it comes to AI and such. So um, for those who've been here over the last two days, you've probably heard a lot about RAG and all these different implementations. And I am going to be going through that again at kind of like a beginner level um, and also showing you how to implement that on OpenSearch. If it's your first time hearing about OpenSearch, then that's great. Um, hopefully it's something that you think about using in the future. Um, and if it's your first time somehow in this room hearing about RAG today, uh, I'll also go into that into some detail. And then after that, I'm going to uh, show you how to set it all up, and at the very end, just show a couple of not live demos. I have a policy against doing live demos, um, because that never ends well, in my opinion. Uh, so moving on, a little bit about me. Once again, my name is Lucas. I am a junior machine learning engineer at Eliatra. We, once again, offer professional solutions for open search. I was previously a robotic process automation engineer for a finance company, which was essentially we took uh, human processes, uh, things that maybe a finance guy did 100 times a day, and then went, well, that is obviously a waste of resources, and then learned to automate it using things like UiPath or Blue Prism. Loved that, and it really gave me my, my start into machine learning and taking kind of these human automative steps a little bit further. Uh, I, of course, love open source AI tools and just models in general. I'm a big advocate for it, so huge fan that I got to meet some of the guys from Hugging Face. So that was a bit of a dream come true. And um, moving forward, we're going to talk a little bit about the landscape, where we are at the moment. Um, so we're kind of like, over the last 10 or so years, we've really seen this emergence of what I like to call a new digital continent. Uh, you'll hear a lot about data lakes which is you know, all these massive pools of data that companies have been harvesting over the last years. And I personally, in my own philosophy of it, think that this all comes together into what I call a large digital continent. And uh, it has been pooled across these things, these companies, for a number of years now. And recently, with the emergence of these chat bots and these AI technologies that are built on top of this data, we're seeing users now, not just our data engineers and our data scientists, being able to explore that data for the very first time. And that has led to incredibly exciting outcomes, and we'll continue to do so as our understanding of these technologies progresses, as we continue to build on top of the technology, and it'll just be really interesting to see how it goes forward. So how do you become an explorer? of this new digital continent, because I'm keeping the buzzwords going, um, you need the proper tools. Um, and throughout history, humans have typically sucked at large-scale data analysis. We're not really good at it. Uh, we can only perceive so much. We've built throughout our entire lifetime tools to help us um, make sense of all of the data and all of the stuff around us. So let's just take a look at a very chop down list of all these statistical tools. I wish I could have actually fit all of it onto one timeline, but it turns out that the abacus was invented a really, really long time ago. But give or take, this is from the invention in the 1600s of the logarithmic tables all the way to today with our chat chatbots. We have a very condensed list of our statistical analysis tools. Um, so we've gone from the logarithmic tables to the mechanical calculators, our punch card systems, that was a big breakthrough, to our computers, data warehousing, big data technologies, and of course today, AI, generative AI chatbots, which if anything are just statistical machines, tools that allow us to make sense of a lot of data. So how do we use these chatbots to help us with this? How do we help them? Uh, well, first, we're going to talk, apparently, about the main barriers to the efficient use of these technologies for both businesses and the consumer. So one, and most obviously, is the people that got across the finish line first uh, are um, kind of gatekeeping a little bit with the cost. If you want to use the most powerful models today, you've got to use things like OpenAI's ChatGPT or Claude, so on and so forth, and you're going to give them money for every API call or every per token response. So that can be a bit prohibitive 
for uh, some companies that are looking to build out AI technologies at scale. Uh, second of all, the major barrier as well is the privacy. Uh, much of the time, you don't know where your data is going. You're putting some documents in, or you're asking some questions, and if you're using some of the big three technologies, uh, you don't know what it's being used for. And this can be incredibly prohibitive for maybe a finance company, a legal company, a medical company, where documents need to be secure, they need to be safe, they need to be black boxed initially, and they can't make use of the frankly amazing statistical and analysis power of these models for the time being. Lastly, computation power. You want to run these big models in-house, you're going to need some heavy machinery to operate at a scaled level. Uh, that is obviously not uh, available to everyone who isn't willing to shell out a lot of money to NVIDIA or uh, Dell or whoever else is powering these technologies for the time being. And then lastly, and the one that is actually, frankly, quite the most important to me, who's building maybe smaller tools, um, tools that are maybe a little more personal, projects, that sort of thing, proof of concepts, ideas, is a lot of the models that we use to build on top of these things are frozen in time. Uh, they have only been trained up to a certain point. They literally cannot perceive of a time past when their training has stopped. Um, and that poses some really interesting challenges if you want to build some tools or some projects out of more up-to-date uh, existing data. Maybe you want to build like a stock analysis tool. You want to track how high NVIDIA is actually really going to go. Uh, you want to uh, do other things that just require that day-to-day -day inference of data. And uh, that's where in my opinion, apart from the prohibitive costs sometimes of fine tuning, if you don't want to do that, or the time costs, uh, retrieval augmented generation comes in. Uh, that helps alleviate the issues that we have with these frozen in time issues of our generative AI models. Um, so, what is RAG? Once again, we're just going to do a quick tour of it again. It is a framework for improving the model performance by augmenting your prompts or your data of your generative AI model uh, with relevant, up-to-date, current data. It could be data that it has never been exposed to because it's maybe private data, uh, company data, maybe your documentation, or stuff that it just does not perceive of past its cutoff training time. Next, it is dynamically capable of adapting to new information without the lengthy retraining costs of maybe fine-tuning or you know, building up a base model again with all this new data that you have. You can just do it on the fly by sending the data in. Uh, it drastically, dr that is a point of contention, but I will be on the side of drastic, uh, minimizes hallucinations, especially when paired with in-depth system prompts and guardrails. And finally, uh, they consist of so many variations. This presentation will go into the more simple or naive implementations of RAG, but as we saw in the presentation before, we had a wonderful example of these self-learning, complex implementations of RAG, where it's taking in documentations and it's testing it against itself or another model to see if it has produced a better or non-hallucinated outcome. Um, so uh, we'll just go for the simple ones, but just know that there are so many different variations of RAG. There's some brilliantly complex ones that I definitely recommend checking out, but we'll just keep with the simple for now. So, uh, this is a very simple implementation of a naive RAG um, implementation. You have your index, where you have your structured and unstructured data that is most of the time vector embedded using some sort of embedding model. You have your user who makes a query to that index. The in, uh, that query is also vector embedded. You then retrieve a document or documents from that index that most um, similarly match the query of the user, and it is loaded into the prompt with the data from the document into the LLM, and then that response is fed back to the user. And it just creates this nice kind of feedback loop where your data is being supplemented by what a index thinks its users want. Um, so let's move on to how we can implement that in OpenSearch. So, or yeah, they call it conversational search, it's RAG, really. Uh, but it allows you to leverage the power of Gen AI um, and retrieve documents and information entirely through natural language. You do not need to be using SQL or DQL or some sort of querying language on OpenSearch anymore if you implement something like conversational search because through the power of vector embedding, you can search and retrieve your documents uh, entirely through natural language, which alone I think is really, really cool. Um, it also involves a thing called the memory index, which is something very cool that OpenSearch has implemented, where much like your typical large-scale LLMs, you can remember the conversations that you're having with your data, and not just you, but the LLM that you're speaking with. It supplements conversationally through the memory uh, all of the context and information and questions you've had about your data, and you can quite literally build a conversation between you and your data. So you can see here in the example, um, this is an example from the demo that I'll show later on. My best friend owns a bar. 
Uh, I thought this was a really cool use case for it. I took all of the data from his bar, put it into an index, vector embedded it, and then we started figuring out, okay, what are the best days that you've had in the bar? What are the worst days? Did you have an event on that day? And together we were able to kind of build this picture, this idea about how well the bar was doing on what days and why. And that's just an example of what makes conversational search uh, powered through open search really, really good. So. Once again, how it works, you have the conversation history that I mentioned before, this memory index that stores the context of your conversation, the entire conversation you've been having, and up to a point supplements that conversation, um, kind of like a max context window thing, almost. Uh, this allows you to avoid repetitions in your outputs, and it learns as you learn. Uh, and then secondly, you have your retrieval augmented generation, um, where you are taking the documents directly out of your index, sending them to the LLM, and then the LLM is sending them back to you, the user. So setting up conversational search in OpenSearch. You have need of a machine learning configured node on your OpenSearch cluster. Uh, this couldn't be any node, really, as long as you uh, tune the parameters there. You don't need to have a specifically dedicated machine learning node. Uh, you can just turn the feature on. Uh, next, for this example, we will be using OpenAI, but in recent weeks, there have been improvements in being able to use your own models. Uh, I personally was able to get it working with Llama 3, uh, Mistral, and more for kind of that cheaper effect. Uh, before this example, we'll be using the OpenAI because it is one of the easier implementations. And then finally, you need an index for your RAG data. So this is data that you have stored on OpenSearch that you have vector embedded at index time, a feature that OpenSearch also allows and also supports very heavily. It's very easy to set up. So now you need to create your connector. You have all of these previous things here. You need to create your connector. What is a connector? In OpenSearch, a connector is a piece of code that allows you to connect to an external third-party machine learning platform. Um, and it'll work with um, Anthropics Cloud, I believe. It'll work with OpenAI. It can work locally if you have Llama 3 running on OLAMA. Um, all of these things, it works. Uh, the connector allows your index to speak with this platform. Um, and this is what it looks like. Don't worry too much about having to take a photo of the code. I will um, upload the slides later. But essentially, you're plugging this into your open search cluster, and you're adding the endpoints to the model, the model's name, the temperature. Most importantly, for those who don't know, the temperature of your model is its, we'll call it like the personality, uh, how choosy it'll be with words. Sometimes you know it'll get a little bit more personality if you ramp it up. But if you set it to zero, it'll stick strictly sometimes to the facts and try to not make up as much or try to have too much of a personality. When you're working with sensitive data, I would recommend turning this all the way down. But if you're looking for something with a little bit of personality, you can definitely ramp it up and see what the um, effects of it are. Uh, next, your credentials, of course, that API key for OpenAI that I mentioned before, and then the type of action that you'll be doing. So you'll be doing like a post to it, you'll be um, sending it to the OpenAI API, and you'll be doing the request body, which will be the model, the messages, and the temperature. The messages here, um, is the data that you'll actually be sending into the prompt at OpenAI, which will be facilitated by the data that you have taken back from your index, along with a prompt that you will set later on directly within um, OpenSearch. So after that, you just uh, register and deploy the model directly on your OpenSearch cluster. Um, so whenever you spin up your cluster, it'll exist there. Um, and this is all being run on Docker, um, which is an absolutely fantastic resource. Um, really wouldn't be using OpenSearch without it. I love it. Um, and once you have the model deployed, you're going to build the RAG search pipeline. So uh, the RAG search pipeline is you have your model deployed on your cluster. You're now going to connect that model to the search pipeline. You're going to provide what sort of information from your documents is going to be sent to the LLM as contextual data. You're going to set that system prompt, and you're going to set the user instructions. So the real important thing, I think, there is point two. Um, you could have a data. You could have a document in your index that is filled with many, many, many different types of information. It could contain an image. It could contain a URL, metadata, text, um, so many different things that open source, uh, open search supports you um, hosting on that database. But for this example, we'll just go into the text. Later on, we have things like nested objects that we're actually able to parse and send into the prompt itself. Um, but yeah, for this simpler example, we build this pipeline. Um, so this pipeline is, Every single time you make a request to this index, it will send this request through the pipeline. Um, and it'll make sure that all these parameters are set, and um, it will do everything that it's supposed to do. 
Um, so we'll see here. But, 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 but we have the model ID. So when we registered and deployed our model before, it gave us this model ID here. Setting this into our search pipeline means that whenever we're doing a search, we are ultimately going to be calling on this model later on down the line to do something. Um, in this, we also have our context field list, the text. So every document that we search for on this index that contains a field called text, the data from that field will be taken from that document and sent to the model for inference. And on top of that, we have, of course, the ever famous, the ones that we love to jury rig with to see how we can get different outputs, our system prompt, and our user instructions. Um, and this can be edited as much as you want, as little as you want, and it will be just to attempt to kind of get a specific type of output from that LLM if you're looking to build a more specific. I just kept them as the default ranges because I was doing it for testing purposes. But um, then finally, we'll have our, I'm not going to go into the specifics of building your RAG index in OpenSearch because we'll be here all day. Um, we need to point our search pipeline that we've created here towards this. We set the context fields to match the text data that we're going to be pulling into the um, prompt, ingest the data, vector embedded its ingest time, and then create the conversation memory and note the ID. And Finally, we'll go into how we actually utilize this. So we have uh, in the RAG test data index, as we can see here on the top left, we have a bunch of information about different um, cities around the world. And specifically, we want to get uh, the population of New York City. And we have maybe 2,000 cities in this index, um, and, but we specifically want to be able to infer on one. So we do a search. We, in natural text, go, what is the population of New York City metro area in 2023? And on the external here, we're putting in the parameters for our RAG search for uh, open searches, uh, open AI's uh, chat GPT. We're uh, calling the model that we're using. We're giving it the question. We're setting the memory ID, which will allow this conversational element. And we're setting context size, message size, and timeout we don't need to worry about. The context size and the message size actually dictate how many documents we will send into the prompt from our index to the LLM. Uh, we can set this to one if we're very, very sure that we only want the context from the first document in our index to be sent in, or we can go as much as five or 10 or 15 based on the models we're using, maybe co max context window. And this will allow us to draw on a larger pool of data um, in order to maybe get a more refined answer. But if we're very sure about it, but this generally does come down to what will most likely become an age-old question in the machine learning and gen AI community, is that garbage in, garbage out. You want your data as clean as possible. You want your data as structured as, or un, yeah, as, structured as possible when you're sending it into something like an LLM, because otherwise, it's going to muddy it up, and you're going to be getting um, stuff that you're just unhappy with on the output. And that's the input on the right. Your output here, as we can see at the very bottom, it'll show us, uh, I have it closed here, because we would have seen all the embeddings. But we've seen that it has returned a document. Um, with a max score value based on the embeddings. Um, it has taken the text from it, and at the very bottom there, you can see the answer. The population of New York City metro area is projected to be ba 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 in um, this year. And this is uh, information that it was able to infer from the document that we sent it in. Uh, at the very bottom there, you'll see the message ID. This can be very important from a logging point of view. You can actually search that index, and you can see every single step that the LLN took uh, in order to come up with that response. You can see the document that was sent into it. You can see which portion of the information was taken from the index in order to come up with that prompt. And ultimately, you can see kind of the timestamps and everything for that. So it does lead a, it does give a very good um, analytics trail for how your data is being taken, how your data is being used, and finally, how your data is being returned to you. So let's go with the additions and the considerations. That was the open search kind of method of uh, making a RAG pipeline. But Let's get a little fun with it and see how we can actually apply that uh, outside of OpenSearch's uh, dev console itself. Uh, first of all, a little game. Can anyone guess what this number signifies? A number that haunts my days as I try to test and make personal projects. Any ideas? No? So this is how much you're paying OpenAI every time you're making uh, an API call to them. Per thousand tokens, you're giving them something like 0 0.002 cents. Frankly, that annoys me, but they've done the work. I guess they can, uh, they're allowed to charge for it. But how do we build beyond that current infrastructure? So currently, OpenSearch, it only does support uh, a, number, a limited number of uh, connectors to existing third-party um, 
platforms. Their platforms and services, they come to cost the users, and if you scale that up, you're going to be out of pocket very, very quickly. But what if we could build connectors to our own locally hosted models? Uh, what if we wanted to keep our data private from these LLMs? And what if we wanted to refine our search capabilities even further? Um, here is, as I mentioned before, this fun little demo that I built using my best friend's bar stock reports. Um, I hooked it up to Llama 3 that was running locally on my computer. And I took about three months' worth of stock reports from his bar, vector embedded it. Um, we'll see here uh, all of the drinks and stuff. We were only really looking at a small sample size worth of things. And uh, we wanted to see what are the best performing drinks based on a day, what are the percentage increases when it's a weekend, um, what if there was an event on that day. And um, we were able to build kind of this rudimentary little demo system. And it's something that he's wanting to build out on now. I feel like there's a lot of use uh, in the restaurant uh, industry. Uh, it's actually picking up in Ireland at the moment which to use these kind of AI analysis tools on stock reporting and seeing kind of where wastage can be saved and uh, how it can impact different things. So this is a cool little example of how to actually utilize this uh, blindingly fast um, vector querying method, as well as using an LLM in order to gain insights on um, kind of these real world use cases, which is I find something that we're always kind of clutching at to find. You know, we, we love the technology, we like to use the technology, but sometimes the real challenge is what is, what is the use case? What, what are we actually going to use it for? What is it that we're trying to disrupt maybe as a wider industry with these kind of technologies? Um, and this is a bit of a final touch on, but something that I'm kind of excited to show. It's been a bit of a personal project of mine uh, that I've worked on the last month or so. And uh, it's always been around these things of like private, free, local, uh, your own little kind of assistance that you're able to use on your own laptop anywhere in the world, offline or offline. And that is Lysa. So Lysa has just been a little fun thing that I've worked on uh, using a combination of open search. Olama, which allows you to directly pull manifests of models onto your own computer and run those models entirely based off of your own hardware. Uh, it stands for a local AI search application. And uh, it does kind of everything that you would expect a small pocket-sized um, LLM um, to do. Um, right now, it features the ability to switch between multiple models, depending on what you have downloaded on your computer. So I've tried the likes of Llama 3, I've done Mistral, I've done uh, the really small parameter ones like Gemma, the 2 billion parameter model by Google. And um, it works, as I said, offline and online. Um, it's totally private. It has the ability to search your computer for files. Right now, it works for PDFs. Um, only, but I am expanding that out to things like CSVs, Excels. Uh, ultimately, you'll be able to do videos, audio, that sort of a thing. And you can upload documents, uh, PDFs, for this example. This is an example of me uploading actually a <coughs> um, presentation from earlier, um, from yesterday, that I saw that I was really interested in. And I said, OK, let's see if we can summarize the document um, into, let's say, 100 words or less. And we can do that. And it'll save it, it'll summarize it. We can have that conversational memory, as I said before, again, with open search, where I can ask uh, follow-on questions and such about it and uh, build kind of that conversation with the data, with the documents. And then finally, as the last example, we have our RAG, uh, where we are connected directly. Now, of course, this requires you to be online for it, but we can connect directly into our uh, index on open search, retrieve documents. You'll see how fast it is here. Um, and ask questions on those documents and, once again, have those conversations. So this is an example of I uploaded all my company, one of the products that my company has, their documentation, um, and a vector embedded all of it, chunked it, and built kind of this uh, easy-to-use uh, documentation reference bot, almost, with it, or index. Uh, you know, the things that I think would be useful, the use case for this maybe is you have a junior and you go, okay, well, read through the documentation or maybe you have a problem with something, just use this, type in your query completely in natural language, get the most relevant piece of documentation back and start from there. Um, but yeah, that is Lysa. Uh, this is, I was working on it over the last two days, so that using Llama 3 is actually a bit outdated already, believe it or not, it's using multiple models. But that is just a little example of what I hope the future of open source um, AI comes to. It's something that is built uniquely for the user, by the user, that they are able to use uh, based on their own, their own hardware, which will only grow in time. 
um, and no doubt we'll have specialized hardware that allows these models to run more effectively on maybe the cheaper options. But uh, the ability to use something like this, I don't think, is something that should be gatekept behind cost or even an internet connection. And it's something that um, anyone should be able to use at any time because it's legitimately a great tool. But yeah, that's everything, guys. Thank you so much for listening to me. Uh, I hope you had a good time. I hope you learned something interesting. Maybe give you some ideas on the outlooks of it. And if you have any questions, um, please do ask. We all ready to go home? It's wonderful. The Elden Ring DLC comes out in a couple of hours, so I have a play. I have a plane to catch. <laughs>